And I'm actually going to talk about fruit, the real fruit. And there are different kinds of fruit. And fruits are a major dietary, dietary source of vitamin A, vitamin C, minerals, an excellent source of dietary fiber as well. Fresh fruits are fairly low in calories because they contain much water and little fat. However, they do contain sugar. It's a natural sugar, but if you eat too much of it, it's not necessarily a good thing. The addition of sugar to canned and frozen fruits increases the calories considerably. The less sugar, the fewer calories. And there are a lot of different kinds of fruit out there. And I'm not going to name them all, but I will name some from A to Z. The most common of ones, we have apples, apricots, avocado, bananas, blackberry, cantaloupe, cherry, dates, durian, figs, grapefruit, grapes, guava, gooseberry, kiwi, kumquat, lemon, lime, mandarins, mango, mangosteen, nectarines, oranges, passion fruit, papaya, peaches, pear, permissions, pineapple, plums, pomegranates, raspberries, strawberry, and watermelon. So if you got all that, then good. If not, you can uh, listen to it again later. But these are the common fruits that are out there. There's, of course, a lot, a lot more of them out there. But I thought I would share that with you. And I don't know if you've tried them all. I haven't tried all of them on that list, but, but they're, they're obviously good. Fruits are delicious. Now, according to a article in National Geographic on July 20th, 2015, there was an artist and a professor, you may have heard about this, uh, from Syracuse University. His name is Sam Van Aken, and he created a tree that produced 40 different varieties of stone fruits or fruits with pits. Some of them being peaches, plums, apricots, nectarines, cherries, and also almonds. And he did this through a technique known as chip grafting. So this grafting process involves slicing a bit of a branch with a bud from a tree of one of the varieties and inserting it into a slit in a branch on the working tree, the main tree. Then wrapping the wound with tape until it heals and the bud starts to grow into a new branch. Now over several years, he adds slices of branches from other varieties to the working tree. And this took about a 10 years to do this project. But in the springtime, this tree of 40 fruit, is what it was called, has blossoms in many hues of pink and purple, and in the summer, it begins to bear the fruits in sequence. Van Aken says, it's both a work of art and a timeline of the varieties blossoming and fruiting. He's created more than a dozen of the trees that have been planted at sites such as museums around the US, which he sees as a way to spread diversity on a small scale. Now, I've never heard of this before, and I've never seen it, and it was very intriguing when I actually saw this article, how you can take all different trees, put them into one, and produce one tree out of that, producing 40 different fruit. It was an interesting idea, and some may argue, is this questioning God and the natural growth of a tree, since they're supposed to be individualized, since he's you know, combining all in one. However, they did produce their own fruit. I mean, the same, or let's say, Peaches, it produced peaches and plums. It's not like they were mixed together, but it wasn't one tree. Now what I thought was interesting about this was there a lot of symbolic significance to it, and I will explain this a little later. But first, as I have listed earlier, there are many types of fruit out there. But what do all of these types of fruit have in common? Well, they don't last forever. No doubt, all of these different types of fruit are delicious, but they are most enjoyable when they are ripe. And they need to be cared for constantly. The tree or bush that produces them needs sunlight, needs water, and good soil in order to grow and produce fruit. And without these important ingredients, the tree will not be able to bear fruit and it will die. Just like us. We need constant caring for, not just from God, but also for ourselves, because we also have an integral part in this. We need vital ingredients to remain good fruit, 
like the Holy Spirit, for example, which gives us strength from God. God is our sunlight, and we should use this light as an example to others, as we are to shine and be a light to the rest of the world. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14 through 16. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house, that is, the church. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven that they may see that we are doing good because we are to be good examples. We need constant food to give us energy and growth, not just physical but also spiritual, just as a tree needs water to grow and to produce. And the food I'm referring to, spiritually speaking, is prayer and Bible study, and we can grow from that. Without prayer, without Bible study, without listening to sermons, without literature that we're producing, we're not going to grow. The tree itself needs to be grounded on good soil so it doesn't fall over during inclement weather, for example, so it is able to bear good fruit. Just as we are supposed to be grounded in our beliefs and not given into the distractions of this world, that could and does at times topple us over. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2 and verses 6 and 7. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it, with thanksgiving. Now we will get hit with inclement weather from time to time. We also may get hit with an axe from time to time, but we remain strong and we will heal and we go on. We don't give up. Now a tree and a house, they go hand in hand as they both need a solid foundation. Let's look at this in Matthew chapter 7. And verses 24 through 27. Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the rock on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So obviously having a solid foundation is important because we're able to withstand the trials that we go through. Building your house on sand or on unfertile soil or whatever you may have it is unstable, and it will fall over, and it can ultimately die. Now there is a necessity of importance for bearing good fruit. Matthew chapter 21 talks about a sequence of events, starting with Jesus driving out the money changers who were using the church to buy and sell goods. <clears throat> and he did this to uncover the wickedness and the sinfulness to, of those who claimed to be serving but showed no evidence of righteousness in their lives. And the rest of this chapter then shows evidence of a genuine life, of faith by producing good fruit. The Jews as a whole had failed during Christ's time, and Christ turned to the Gentiles, as was warned by the prophets in Malachi 1.11. But in Matthew chapter 21, verses 18 through 22, we read about the cursing 
of the fig tree because it had no fruit on it. And let me just go there real quick. You can go there too if you like. Matthew chapter 21, verse 18 through 22. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. This actually goes together with the cleansing of the temple it talks about earlier. Because it was going hand in hand, this sequence. And I was doing some research on the internet, and I came across a site uh, from Bible.org, and they explained this part uh, this chapter is saying that the question then is often raised as to why Jesus would curse a tree that was not supposed to be in season. Because at that time, as he was, as he was crossing, uh, as he returned to the city, it was a little bit earlier as when the tree would be producing figs at that time. However, since there were still leaves on the tree, the question came into play. Well, the action was symbolic. The point is that the leaves on the tree advertised that there were figs there as well, but it was false advertisement. Jesus used this to teach a memorable lesson. The tree was cursed, not just because it was not bearing any fruit, but, but because it was making a show of life that promised fruit, but it delivered none. What Jesus intended by this acted parable was that those who make a show of being religious, but in fact are spiritually barren, will be cursed. In this context, it would apply directly to Israel, but it applies to all people who produce no evidence of genuine spiritual life. This teaching harmonizes with the previous account of the cleansing of the temple, as I mentioned, and prepares for the messages to come, which will be later on Matthew chapter 23. The Jewish leaders in the context of Matthew are the primary targets for the advertised piety without producing true righteousness. And we see a lot of that through this chapter. The next part of this chapter having to do with Jesus' authority being challenged in verses 23 through 27. And he was confronted by the very hypocrites, and had they listened to his teachings and understood what he was saying, not to mention the miracles that Christ had performed, they would have known the source of his authority when they asked him in verse 23, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? And its article points out saying, Jesus responded to their question with a question of their view of John's baptism. By referring to John's baptism, he was of course referring to John's entire ministry. And his reply was masterful. If the religious leaders answered correctly, that is, that John's ministry was of God, that they would have the answer to their own question, for John was sent by God as a messenger of Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 to prepare the way for the divine Messiah. If John was that messenger, then Jesus is a Lord who comes to his temple. But if they said it was not of God, then the people would rise against them because they did, they did believe John was a prophet from God, which is why the leaders refused to answer. But Christ answered this question with a question, since they didn't understand what he was teaching, but rather were looking for ways to accuse him of blasphemy or blaspheming, etc., and since they questioned his authority, he questioned their spiritual competence and their righteousness, which they obviously lacked. The parable of the two sons, later on in this chapter, verses 28-32, showed that the sinners, like the tax collectors in this example, had a better chance to make it into the kingdom than the selfish and the proud, because they recognized their sins and repented. That is, the tax collectors recognized their sins and repented. So the decision, or the distinction, is between religious leaders with expressed intentions and public sinners who changed their minds and entered the kingdom. The article, uh, quoting from the article, it, it says then, In the context, this parable is an open rebuke to the religious leaders who were opposing Jesus. I'm sorry, in this context, this parable is an open rebuke to the religious leaders who were opposing Jesus. They, like the fig tree, made all the appearances of being spiritual and devout, 
but they showed no signs of repentance and no acts of righteousness. The sinners who believed and repented would have a share in the Messiah's kingdom. The parable of the tenants, or the parable of the wicked vine dressers, in verses 33 to 46, is also very interesting because this is prophetic, what Christ was giving here. And when we see in verse 33, it starts off by saying there was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard. The landowner being God the Father, the vineyard referring to Israel, and set a hedge around it, dug a winepress in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to the vine dressers, who were the tenants, let's say, the leaders of the, uh, of the nation, and went into a far country. Now when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers, and the servants being the prophets, and they might, that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. This is God the Father, referring to Christ here as the son who is being sent. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said amongst themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? And they said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. And Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it, referring to the church of God. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whoever it falls it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard, heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. And that was correct, because he was. So, the article points out, when explaining this part, or let's say a summary of all these, the theme of these four sections is a teaching of the authority of Christ that the religious leaders and most of the people had failed to do what God had intended them to do, to be the faithful people of God producing works of righteousness. Paul will tell the Romans that because of their unbelief, the natural branches of the tree were lopped off and wild branches grafted into the tree. Gentiles have been grafted into the tree that is by God's grace been brought into Israel's new covenant. Now, what's so interesting about this is what I brought up in the beginning with the article from National Geographic about the, about the uh, artist, whoever, who came up with that tree. Grafting, putting branches of, from other trees all together in one. And that's where I thought the symbolism was interesting because since Christ here you know, is referring to the Gentiles because point being, God is not, you know, favorable. So every, he's going to pick whoever or call whoever. It doesn't matter what race or doesn't matter what type of people they are because everybody has a chance. And that's what was interesting about that. So Paul warns that if God did not spare the natural branches of the tree, those generations of Jews who rejected him, he need not spare us either if we do not produce righteousness. In the end... That is what is important, is who is producing righteousness. Who is producing righteous fruit? Good fruit. The warning for all time is that God rejects the show of piety without the fruit of righteousness. Those who claim to be devout must submit to the authority of Christ and bring forth fruit of repentance, a changed life. Now, what makes us one of a kind? is the title of the message because that's what we are we are not just some ordinary fruit we are the first of its kind and as we heard this morning and throughout this day we are the first fruits we are special we are unique and if we obey and take care of ourselves we will be forever ripe not just temporarily but we will be ripe forever 
and our appreciation to this calling that God has blessed us with to be the first fruits and to have the first chance now to be a part of his family can be expressed by the meaning of this day today.